Welcome to our day nine of the festival. It's not great to be back to the theater. I'm so happy, so happy. We are, our team is so thrilled to see your face again. Kind of. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm João Federici, I'm the world cinema programmer and also the, the Viver Cine Manager Initiative for the festival. And it's my pleasure to welcome to the US premiere of Seven Prisoners in association with Itaco Listido. Yeah. <laughs> the next night is, is in association with the Tacolisti.com, Latino Classifieds, and is sponsored by Lucasfilm. I wanted to yes, I wanted to give them a, a huge, huge thanks for believing the importance of Viver Cine, which connects audiences with Latin America, Latinx, and Spanish language stories, stories throughout the most innovative and compelling movies. Also, thank you all for following the protocols, the safety protocols, and maxing, max, mask, masking up. You are, we are all together in this, and uh, Mill Valley, would, could, Mill Valley could, could not happen without you, your support. Also, I want to shout out a sh big one to our house manager and uh, our the crew of this fantastic for the this fantastic and a safe experience back to the theaters. Also, a special thank you to Netflix. As you have noticed, we have a new way to explore our programs this year, our films. Uh, we divide in categories we call strengths. Seven Prisoners is part of our surprise strength. The category of films offer different perspectives on issues or events that enrich and sometimes challenge our held assumptions. And I am thrilled to have Seven Prisoners as part of our Mill Valley 2021 program a film that I had the chance to follow in different stages. And uh, I would like to invite up my friend and the co-writer and director of Seven Prisoners, Alexander Morato. Good evening. It's wonderful to be back in a theater I missed this and it's great to see everybody here some familiar faces some new faces um, I'm very proud to have the film here at Mill Valley we did our uh, sound mix at Skywalker the great Tom Myers our mixer is here um, the great Chris Martin from Mission Film and Design our colorist and our guitarist team and of course, the wonderful SF film that supported us very much from the beginning at the screenwriting stage, Rosie Morales, Sofia Castro, wonderful to have you here. So uh, great to have a partially San Francisco film, Bay Area film here. And, and um, I, I won't say much, uh, I'll say stick around afterward, we'll have a discussion. Um, this is a film that's very important to me. It, deals with a global issue of modern day enslavement and human trafficking. And it's a film that I spent a long time researching. I spoke with survivors of enslavement. Um, we have people in our cast who survived enslavement. And I just want to take a moment to thank Netflix, who's brave enough to get behind this project and had our back from the get-go. And um, the wonderful uh, Rodrigo Santoro and Cristian Malieros, our Malier, cast, yeah. and um, we'll talk more. About we'll talk everything. about it. My producer <laughs> Ramin Barani and Fernando Merelli is just an incredible team. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the film and uh, stick around for our conversation. Thank you. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you for sticking around. And uh, yeah, I hope you like the move. Seven Prisoners had its world premiere in Venice, yeah, as I said before, last month. And is Netflix globally releasing it in November 11th. And uh, if without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite to the stage the co-writer and director of Seven Prisoners, Alexander Morata. Thank you. How's everyone doing? <laughs> <laughs> After that, thank you, Alex, for accepting our invitation. Thanks and for inviting us. Yes, and congratulations on your most gripping social realist movie thank I've you. seen this year. You know. Thank you. Uh, let's start in this conversation with that way. We always ask, then we, we all, all want to know how did you come up with the idea to talking about the modern ens enslavement and human trafficking? Yeah, well, thank you. It's a great question because I was finishing my first film, Socrates, and um, I was in post-production. I was in Sao Paulo and um, I was staying with family. I was having trouble sleeping one night, so I turned on the TV um, and this piece came on, on the news about modern day enslavement and human trafficking in Brazil. And there was some footage that I saw, taken very recently, and there was a young man and he literally had a chain to his ankle. And this is a global alpha city in the 21st century. I couldn't believe my eyes and it disturbed me and it kept me up, and I couldn't, I couldn't, when I see things that disturb me or bother me, I, I tend to actually look more closely rather than look away for some reason. And I don't know why it is, but I, I feel like you have to face it. I feel like if, it, if it's bothering you, if it's keeping you up, you have to look more closely. So that's what I did, and I just started a very extensive research process. I started by, um, reading everything I could read, books, articles. I created a spreadsheet and a tracker and I just kept track of them. And then from there, I spoke with journalists who cover this topic and uh, it really all culminated with a week where I shadowed a friend who had partnered with the UN and Brazil's Department of Labor to speak with people who had actually survived enslavement. And so I met many people of all ages and heard their stories and that was really powerful and moving. And so I hope that through the story, I could channel everything I'd learned um, through the film. And uh, uh, Seven prisoner Prisoners, plus your first film, Socrates, were co-written with Thaisa Monteso. Uh, how is to work with Taina? And uh, could you explain a bit about uh, your development process with her that uh, uh, I also met her and I saw part of the, the process. How was that again to to work with Taina? Well, I met Taina Mantesu in 2016. She was 18 years old yeah. and I was working with UNICEF at the time on Socrates and the whole idea of my first film is that it would be um, produced and acted by uh, at-risk youth from the local low-income communities. And she came on as my assistant and I started uh, working with her as my assistant, but then I noticed she would always be looking over my shoulder when I was writing. And I don't like when people look over my shoulder. So I would kind of just stare at her like, what are you doing? And she was like, that line is not good. Change it to this. And I was like, okay, bold, I like it. And um, and then, so before I knew it, I was like, well, what do you think of this? And she was like, it's it's crap, get rid of it. What do you think of this? It, uh, she was like, it would be better like this. I'm like, God, 
she's good. So, uh, um, I, I, before I knew it, she was contributing to scenes, and then and then she ended up just coming on board to co-write the script with me. So uh, naturally, after that process finished and and the film did so well internationally and and everything, you know, people were asking, "Who is she? Who is she? Are you working with her again?" And I said, "I don't know. Do you want to?" And she was like, "Yes, of course." So we applied to a grant together, the SF Film Grant, and um, we won it. And so she flew, came. She to, moved here. She came here. She, it was her so first time getting on an airplane. She flew out here to SF, and we spent two months doing the residency here, and then. We also did some writing in Brazil, and it was just really great to have her because the whole idea with the script is we wanted it to be from the perspective of the workers. And and unfortunately, um, people who are most at risk for uh, modern-day enslavement are low income and come from the neighborhoods she was born and raised in. So she just knew exactly how to write the dialogue. She knew exactly how to make it authentic. And um, I think it was just, a, just I, I feel so blessed to have been able to work with her on the project. And I think it makes it more authentic. And she's doing great now. I can't even get her anymore. She's on a Netflix series. She's doing a Globo series. She's so busy. I'm like, go, go, do it, make money. And she's doing great. Very proud of her. So great. Uh, this also is your second time in working with Chris Ma Christian Malieros, the actor. Um, who plays Mateus? Who plays Mateus? And also with the great actor, the Brazilian actor Rodrigo Santoro, also work here in American productions. You might know him as Xerxes yes. in Three Hundred. <laughs> <laughs> he was really in makeup in that one, but he did a great. There was no makeup. That's him. <laughs> okay. Anyway, and uh, could you tell us about your whole? I know that uh, you have a different way to cast your movies. Tell yeah, well, us why you cast your movies. Uh, Christian Malieros uh, plays the lead role in my first film, Socrates. I found him in a high school. I auditioned a thousand young people for that role. It's, strangely enough, he was the first person I auditioned, uh, literally, because he was so excited. I went to his high school. He was the first in line. And the first audition, he sat down. And here he is, he's like 17 and just so excited. And I'm like, well, do you act? And he's like, I've been acting since I was nine years old. He does. And then I found out he was studying at a really, really special drama school. Um, they only let in people who are 18 over. Here he is 17, he's already in his third or fourth year at the school. I'm like, well, he must be really special. Um, but he was acting just so big for the theater, you know? And, and one day I told him after like, I think it was his fourth audition, and he kept just making it. It was just too much. And I said, Christian, listen, the camera is an x-ray. Everything you do is just going to magnify it times 30. You need to act smaller. And he got it right then. And I said, okay, if he can take direction that well, plus, you know, all his other qualities. He's charismatic. He's very good at improvising, and born and raised in the neighborhoods that I was filming in. So I actually, you know, after, when Socrates came out, It really stunned the industry because he was nominated for Best Actor at the Spirit Awards. Now, he's the first and only Brazilian to ever have gotten that nomination. True. So here he is, 18 years old, competing with Joaquin Phoenix and yeah, Ethan Hawke. Yeah, that's that. So, I, I mean, I was like, we have a once in a generation shot to make this guy a star. And he is now, and, and he's doing so great in this film. He went from like a thousand to like a million Instagram followers. He's in a big <laughs> Netflix series. I also can't get him anymore. But I'm just so happy that we were able to shoot this before the second season of his series. And, and that is doing well, we, really well. Netflix literally changed the entire schedule to accommodate his schedule because of his series with, with Netflix. So it's okay, like, yeah. it's great when the people you find in a high school, all of a sudden, like you have to change your schedule to accommodate them. I'm very proud of him. Right, so and Rodrigo Santoro, just yeah, amazing. Yes. I mean, what an incredible actor. What a great face. I grew up watching his work. So of course, my first meeting with him, I was a little scared. Um, and uh, he has a reputation for being very focused, very driven. And our first meeting, we sat down at the table for three hours. 
I had to go to the bathroom, maybe half the meeting, but I didn't. I said, I, I, this is Rodrigo Santoro. I cannot get up. So I just sat there and he's just endless energy asking all these questions. What's this? What's that? And it was like that the whole way through. I mean, he would, he would show up early. He would get there before the crew got there. I mean, he gave 120% and he physically completely transformed himself. Totally. I remember him in Carandiru is another film, Hector Babenco, the director, the Brazilian director, Brazilian Argentinian director. Kiss of the Spider Woman. Yeah, Shachi. that's Hector Babenco and the uh, director. And uh, what amazing, when I, uh, I, I watch Rodrigo Santoro, in Karandiru. He plays a trans, a sex, trans worker. sex worker. It's fantastic. I said, he's a guy. Him, uh, he's uh, a chameleon. Yeah. He can do anything. So, he did this Cuban film. It's so charming. So. Uh, oh, he's the prince of Brazil. He is a prince. But he transforms himself. Yeah. He did this film called A Translator where he plays a uh, Russian. Tr or, well, he plays a Cuban man. We play here in You played a translator here. Okay, yeah, great. Translator. So he plays a Cuban watch. doctor who translates Russian for a living. He spoke in a Cuban accent, and he's Brazilian, and he learned Russian for the role. Yeah, yeah. You can, uh, also I'm curious about how did you cast a real life uh, victim? victim of human trafficking. How is how was it for you and it, for him to be in the set of, you know, to live in that situation again? Well, that was um, uh, Joseph, I call him uh, Romeo, um, but uh, um, uh, he has a, a nickname. We called him Romeo most of the time, but he's credited as Joseph, his birth name. and. And he is from Bolivia. He immigrated to uh, Sao Paulo um, and as a refugee there. In his first six months, as soon as he arrived, they took his passports, they locked him up in a sweatshop, and he was there for six months, and he couldn't call his family, he couldn't leave. They said, if you leave, the police will murder you. That was actually a detail that I took from his story and put in the script. There's a scene where he puts something in a cell phone and holds it up and it's a translation of, of what he had heard. I made sure that he spoke with the cast, the whole cast heard his story. Um, having him on the set every day was really important because it reminded us what we were doing. So um, you want to treat this topic with respect and he was just very lovely. He was, you know, he was just one of the gang, one of the crew. Um, he was there every day and really smart person, really nice person, and and um, you know everybody everybody could feel the energy that he brought. But you know, I mean, just on a day to day, you're working together, so it's fun, it's intense, it's everything. But I asked him, I said, "Are you sure you want to do this?" And he said, "I I need to do this." It was very cathartic to him, and um, so it's just great to be able to work with him. As we both are from São Paulo, Brazil. And we have families that we heard a lot of histories before of the workers in the same situation in Bon Retiro neighborhood, you no. Know? And uh, uh, I push a little bit uh, pull back your. How did you research this? You said that uh, you did that a lot, and uh, what do you went for? What do you? The first thing I asked, I asked a journalist, I said, can I go to the sweatshops? And he said, you're crazy. You can never go to the sweatshops. That's just dangerous for you and for the workers and everyone. So I knew that was out, out the window. Um, so in terms of actually the locations, I, I knew I wanted to set it in a place where historically this kind of thing happened. So I thought, where, where, where are all the factories? And the junkyard, it took me, God, just months of thinking, well, where first I was like, should it be a construction site? Should it be, you know, um, a, a manufacturing? Should it be factory? The junkyard idea, I mean, it kind of came naturally yeah. because I thought, well, what happens to all this junk from the supply chain? And then Taina, her father used to strip copper wire. So she, she actually had the copper wire idea. And she was like, it would be interesting because the copper wire 
is worth a lot of money and also kind of connects everything and, and then it just kind of took off from there. There's that sequence where you, you go from the wires and, and, and we're thinking, how do we do that? And um, I was talking to Ramin Barani and he said, well, he said, think, think about maybe it doesn't all have to be from the perspective of Matthias. Maybe you can leave his perspective and make it more global in a scene with music or something. And, and that's how we started writing that. Interesting. And uh, you, you also, you just mentioned it, Ramin Barani. Uh, you, I know that you have a funny story with him, that when you first time met him and you worked together with him, and, oh, uh, yes, yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, also, just to to say that uh, you have two two great, two big producers behind your production. That is, uh, uh, besides of Netflix, but it it is, you know, Hamin, Ramin, and Fernando Meirelles, who directed two popes we had here two years ago, and uh, and the back Siege of God. And uh, could you tell us, tell a tell a story with Ramin because he becoming you your mentor almost no? Well, I, actually, the first person I met was um, uh, Fernando Meirelles, and yes, like Shuang said, he directed City of God, and that was like the movie, yeah. you know. And I remember I was doing high school in Sao Paulo, and um, I. He came because his um, daughter was studying in the grade above me at the school. So he brought City of God. I'm 14 years old. He shows the film. Afterward, there's just a swarm of you know high school kids around him. And I waited until the swarm subsided. And then I walked up to him and I said, I'm Alexander Morato and I'm going to be a director. <laughs> and I remember he just looked at me and he just smiled. And he stayed with me for like 10 minutes and he listened to my little 14 year old questions and, and gave me some advice. And then um, I didn't talk to him until a couple years ago. And, and, and but I'll tell you how I re-encountered him. Now, I went to film school, I skipped a grade. So at 17, I went to film school. And Ramin Barani, the director of um, The White Tiger and 99 Homes, he was making a film in town and I was just so board of class and I said I need to do something so I heard he needed interns and I was like the first one there but he, he needed 18 year old interns 18 and up and he needed interns who spoke Spanish I was 17 I didn't speak Spanish so I just lied yes sir yes I and um, and he never noticed I was actually speaking Portuguese to all the to all the yeah I was like faking it and they would all stare at me like I'm crazy you know and I'm like god is he gonna notice but he didn't notice and 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 then we would just hang out in the car all day like going from place to place and I was like learning everything around and then uh, You know, I turned 18 and I learned Spanish in the course of that job. It was like six months. So I, I lied, but the truth, you know, the lie became the truth, so it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I told him recently, he was like, that's okay. Um, <laughs> and then we made Socrates, he produced Socrates, he helped me. You know, I was showing him Christian's tapes and, and everything. And then um, we made Socrates and um, I, we, we uh, took the film to Fernando Morales's company for post-production and somebody there apparently walked into a screening room and saw and they're like What, what's this it's kind of good and and then and then my producer sent it to one of my other producers sent it to them for distribution and they accepted it and then they showed it to Fernando and we asked if he would come on board to help bolster the film a little more globally and and he he said absolutely yes and um, he loved the film and And then um, he tells me, he told me recently, I saw him last week, that he asked me for Seven Prisoners. I don't remember that way. I remember coming to him, I was like, please, will you do it? But he tells me that, I, that he asked me, will you please send me your next script? So that's how he got involved with um, Seven Prisoners. Interesting. Also, that uh, you come from the Socrates that I, I know that it wasn't really tight and a small budget. $20,000. 
And that's because I applied for funding for seven years. My family can attest to this. And, <laughs> and every single granting organization and funding partner, everything in the entire industry of film said no to me. So I said, well, what am I going to do? Yeah. So I just worked really hard as a waiter. I worked as an assistant editor. I, I did all sorts of, I worked at a grocery store, saved up money, and I, you know, 20K, that was what I was able to do. Oh, and my dad gave me, like, I think $2,000, so that Thank helped. You, dad. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dad, that was amazing. <laughs> yes. And uh, now you have Netflix behind of the, the, this production. How is that for you? How, how was work with Netflix? Well, the budget was more than $20,000. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Um, I mean, it's incredible. It was also very, like, at first it's like overwhelming. You're like, oh my God, you don't screw this up because all of a sudden, you know, it's, it's just a bigger, bigger beast. But at the same time, like, it's great because everybody got paid. Like, Christian got paid, Taina got paid, I got paid. So, like, you know, for the first time in, in my life, it's like, oh, wait a second, like, I don't have to put it on my credit card. Because I was in tens of thousands of credit card debt. Like, my dad, like, gave me to, like, my stepmom, my dad gave me 10,000. I won several awards, so I was, like, in tens and tens of thousands of credit card debt from Socrates. So it's just incredible to go from that to you're paying to make a movie to suddenly you're getting paid to make one. It, it's just beautiful, and of course, the whole structure that that comes with, I mean, just just the teams that are behind it, they do such great work. There's like five or six of them here tonight, so it's just wonderful to have this beautiful team behind us. And so I always feel like they have my back. Yeah. I hope I hope we'll make another movie together. <laughs> yes. And uh, also, this was a terrible moment we have in the past year, this pandemic. Uh, how the pandemic impact your production? We were so lucky. I was shooting the movie in uh, January uh, and Sao um, Paulo. in Sao Paulo, January and February of 2019. And um, no, 2020. Yeah, 2020. When did the pandemic start? 2020. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's COVID-19, but it really should be COVID-20. So basically, um, <laughs> The, I was shooting the film, and then one day I just, I, I'm like the AD, the assistant director, the whole team, they're like standing around their cell phones, and I'm like, guys, what are we shooting? They're like, hold on, hold on, like, what's happening? They're like, well, COVID, I'm like, what? What, tell me what's the next setup, and is, you know, are, are we ready, are they, have they finished their makeup? They're like, no, I don't think you understand, like, there's a pandemic. I was just so busy shooting, but you know, I just, I started hearing people, and I could tell, and I was like, forget it and my, my ad was like this is going to become a, a worldwide global pandemic my dad's a doctor believe me i'm like don't be ridiculous like let's just keep shooting and um i remember i got a call and they're like we might have to shut you down and i was like no i have two more days left to shoot like don't shut me down so luckily they didn't shut me down i got my last two days i remember that night the embassy the american embassy said last call for u.s citizens if you want to fly back so I said, well, maybe I should get on a flight tonight. We booked a flight, and then as I'm going to the airport, they canceled the flight. I'm like, well, do, is it because of the pandemic? And then I looked at the news, it was American Airlines. They, sh they shut down the whole fleet. And then, so the next day I was able to fly out with Delta, and, and when I was at the airport, uh, the people next to me weren't allowed to get on the plane because it would, they were going to Canada, and they shut down the border that night. So I flew out the last night. When I arrived in, at SFO, there was nobody at the airport. And it was the first day of the lockdown, and there was nobody at the airport. So I mean, I think it was just, I mean, luck that we finished the movie the day the lockdown was done. That's incredible. I was asking you what's your uh, biggest challenges in, the, in this production, maybe you just to answer. I don't well, know. Um, I, I mean, know. I think the big challenge for for all of us and the crew was just we, it was, we had a very limited window that we could shoot. We're going to start shooting in March, but because of cast availability that I mentioned before, we had, there was either delay to this year or lose three months of prep and start shooting in January. Thank God 
we just said, let's just do it and rush because I don't think we'd have a movie right now because everything, the whole world shut down. Um, but the challenge was just, you know, we only got five weeks of prep and pre-production. I don't think it shows, but you know, it was very like, it was very intense to, sh to prepare that way. Um, but again, you have Netflix behind you, it's a lot of resources and so it was just great to have them. And they understood too, like there's some scenes that we had, there was like, the weather was terrible, there was a day where it was the worst flood in recorded history of Sao Paulo, everything flooded. The crew, I was like, I show up on set, like, where's the crew? And I start getting pictures of the crew, they're like standing on top of a flooded vehicle on a flooded highway, so things like that. But Netflix was really gracious, they gave us some extra day, two, like two extra days or three extra days to pick up. So those were the big challenges, like schedule, flooding, that kind of thing. <laughs> what do you hope, audiences, you take away from your film? Well, I, I left the ending kind of open because I, I hope that everybody will sort of figure it out on their own and bring their... I feel like the audience is the last writer of the movie. Like, the Socrates had an open ending. This sort of has an open ending. So I, I hope the audience just f does their own ending based on who they are as a person and what they believe. Um, but I would hope that we can start having a bigger discussion about this. I mean, it's kind of painful that this is still happening. I think it's a, it's a painful movie in a way, but I, I think it's important that it be painful because there's 40 million people in the world who are enslaved these days. That's a lot of people. And, and you know, these, it can, it can be anyone. And for me, like personally, like, after working with low-income communities in Brazil, which are most at risk for trafficking, these are my friends, my colleagues, my co-writer, my lead actor, it's where they're born and raised. I hope we'll remember that we won't turn a blind eye to these invisible, so-called disposable people. We'll remember that these are people, they have family, and um, I just hope we'll think about that more. Uh, because we all like cheap, you know? Um, I like cheap, you like cheap, I'm not gonna lie, cheap is good, right? But it comes at a cost, and this microphone, the cell phones we're holding in our hands, the clothes we're wearing, very likely they were all made by enslaved hands, and that's really painful to think about. So I wanted to make a film that wouldn't judge anyone specifically, because I, sadly, I think in a way we're all complicit, we just don't know it. So I think we just need to start thinking about that in a bigger way, and I hope the film achieves that. Thank you. Uh, as you know, uh, due to the safety protocols, we are not sharing our mics. But if you have one question, and you can say clear and loud, and we can he can answer. I will open this, <laughs> like breaking the roll a little bit, but... I see two hands raised. Okay, I did I that. I, I, here okay, here. please, here, the first to hear. Thank you, your movie is fantastic. Thank you. I can hear you loud and clear, and we'll repeat your question so yeah. the audience yes. can hear. You said you met survivors, and you maybe share how you met them what they went on to do, how they survived? Yeah. Do I need to repeat No, it? I did, she asked She about asked about survivors. Survivors and how he met them. Yeah, and, and maybe repeat some things that I heard. Um, my friend, uh, Krista Costa in Brazil, she um, called me one day and she was like, I hear about this project you're doing that you're researching. She heard through friends and I was like, yeah. And she's like, well, I'm doing something too. She's a journalist. I'm interviewing survivors of modern day enslavement and human trafficking. And she, she's just a very smart person. She partnered with the UN, Brazil's Department of Labor. And I was like, oh, I need to be there immediately. This is exactly what I need. And so she just let me shadow her. So we spent a week together um, at the um, museum that they shut down for this project. And the, the, it was a really beautiful project. It was 
not just interviewing people, but also connecting them with potential employment and, and helping them understand. Because so, sadly, a lot of people who get in, in these systems, they'll fall right back into them after they're freed. Um, it's, it's a really difficult thing. So it was um, many different people. It was a lot of women, which is interesting because the film deals with male characters. Um, and the reason I, I dealt with male characters is that with the uh, f uh, female characters, the women that I met through this, a lot of them were sex workers, a lot of trans to sex workers, which I was surprised to find. And I just, I didn't want to make a film about sex work. So it, I, I decided to focus on, on the labor aspect of it. And I had already sort of, I was already working on the script at that point. But it, you know, it was, um, I would say maybe 70, 80% were women. They were just wonderful. I mean, sex workers, um, costureras, uh, como é que fala? Seamstress, 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 like um, you know, at the sweatshops. Um, a lot of Peruvian women, a lot of Bolivian women. Um, there are also some Venezuelan men who were there. I thought that was interesting. Venezuela is going through such a difficult time. Um, I mean, the stories are really you know powerful, and and we're talking about people coming from very very difficult background, circumstances, um, people who really need a job, people who really need out of a difficult situation. Um, so just a lot of really powerful stories. And um, I put some of them into the script. Like I didn't think of doing sweatshops in the movies. And then I met the Peruvian women. And after they told me, and then the actor, you know, one of my actors. So it's just, it's, it's, um, it was about 60 women, um, and I think about 20 men, if I remember correctly. Uh, I need to wrap, but I, yeah. it, could you? Just quickly, um, Alex, congratulations. Um, Thank it, you, Nancy. Your film reminds me of Pichote, I think we talked about it. So that's a film I saw 40 years ago, and I just wonder if you could say something about social realism and the history of that, because you did such an incredible job in the same way that that film, you know, which I saw when I was there's a whole history of this kind of cinema in, in Latin America. Thank you, um, and I'll, I'll keep it brief because I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, uh, we talked about Hector Babenco, director of. Yeah, Shaw it's the Street. same director. Yeah. yeah, and he worked with um, Rodrigo on on Carangiru. Um I saw Pichachi in film school. I fell in love with it. Um, it reminded me also of uh, Chop Shop Ramin's film, and um, I just couldn't get Pichachi out of my mind. And I actually met his. Um, his uh, he, he's deceased recently, but I met his um, partner who was married with him to, to him until Barbara his Paz. death, Barbara Paz, and she was at her premiere, and and I, I thanked her. I told her, you know, if it weren't for Pichach and Hector Babenco, I wouldn't even know where to start with a film like this. And um, I mean, films like that, uh, it wouldn't. Ex I mean, here's the thing: uh, Brazil is just such an interesting, fascinating place. You don't really have to make anything up you can just turn the camera on and start filming and all of a sudden you're getting incredible stories powerful stories stories about real people and so of course that's that when i said i wanted to make films in brazil i i i went back to the source and, and pichach and city of god there's so many incredible social realist films so yeah. thank you so much oh oh i need to Uh, I think my dad. Can I ask think you me have a dead later. question. I cannot. It's not a question. It's a statement. No, Alex. The thing is, one thing that just came to me is this: many years, a few years ago, probably ten or fifteen years ago, I'm not going to go into the details why, but I drove this woman home. She just been let out of jail, and I drove her to her home, and in the conversation, I didn't ask her why she was in jail or anything like that it became very clear to me she was a sex worker. And she was very embarrassed about it, and she wanted to be let in the back door to her place. So I just drove her there and I let her in and I let it go. And the thing that just gets me on listening to all of this and stuff is just, you see it at times, but it's like I didn't do anything. 
right? What did I, what do I do? Who am I, right? But it still sticks to me today, that whole thought about this woman and what she was going through, and I'm sure she didn't want to be where she was. But it exists everywhere, not just in those shops, it exists here in our own area. So. Well, you did your part, and I think we all have to do our part, you know? Yeah. We make the film, we talk about it, I think if we talk about it more, and, and, and we all just have to do our part. That's a good story. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.